to our guys' 12th annual meeting. Uh, I'm Dr. Chan, the president of the uh, our Cross Board of Directors. Um, so, uh, first, I'm going to recognize uh, recognize the people on the board and other people involved. So, first, um, I'd like to say thank you to our board of directors for their leadership throughout the year. Um, I'm going to list them by name, and if you want to stand up, when I listen, when I say your name, feel free. Uh, James Hickey. Okay. Oh, James Hickey, Nina Conway, Beth Lucy, Brian Snell, Richard Wyman, Richard Abardi, Elaine Webb, Sherry Vandenberger, Dave Grant, Jennifer Hillary, Joanne Senders, Pete Jeffrey, uh, Mark Sagawa, David Clark, Brian Lewis, Batcher from the Reading Police Department, uh, the Public Schools, Chuck Robinson, Linda Snow Doxer, and uh, John Darwin, uh, Tom Zayer, uh, and Kate Boynton. And also Laura Gannon, Laura Hillian, and John Halsey, Bob Lasher, and Richard Hand from uh, uh, the town. Um, also, uh, Garrett Collins. The two people who aren't on this list, uh, who I would be very remiss in not thanking, are the two people who really make our CASA work by uh, educating, uh, presenting, and organizing all our events throughout the year, such as this one tonight. And that's our outreach coordinator, Julian DeAngelis.
talk about the issues with loved ones, and take action and to be known. And visit our website at reagan.k12.ma.us/community/arcasa to learn more about how you can be part of the efforts to sustain our work. Now later on, Sherry Ben and Acker will uh, come up here as our keynote uh, presenter tonight. But right now, we're going to welcome uh, Eric McDonough, who will, who will provide a short presentation on our co coalition partners. with a celebration because um, Sherry was kind enough to travel down to DC at the beginning of the month and accept our beautiful national award for our CASA's work on Recovery Month last year. And so I want to tell you a little bit about the award ceremony. So um, it was a Recovery Month luncheon um, that was held in, in Washington, DC. Uh, the nation's leaders from around the country gathered together for this luncheon, 200 leaders from around the country, including Sherry. Uh, representing our CASA, um, to really celebrate those who've achieved recovery and also to remember those that, that didn't make it. Um, and also to inspire folks who maybe haven't quite got there yet that recovery is possible. Um, there was some pretty cool uh, company to be in, so to speak, for our CASA. We were one of three award winners for this project. Um, the other two winners were Utah Support Advocates and the Institute for Research, Education, and Training in Addictions. There were three uh, awards in the entire country, and our CASA was proud enough to accept one of those awards. So what did we win for? So last uh, September, many of you remember, we had our first National Recovery Month here in Reading. We had a series of events where we tried to link and talk about the issue of substance use disorder in our community to celebrate those who have been able to achieve recovery and to really rally folks around the message of recovery and support while not forgetting those who we've lost. We started the month with a select board proclamation that um, Bob and the selectmen were proud enough to, to present to us and that meant a lot. Um, there were a lot of people who came up to me throughout the month and mentioned what a powerful message that sent because it was being acknowledged at a very formal meeting. Um, and it was an acknowledgement that uh, folks who are in recovery are part of every part of our community. Um, and some of them may be living anonymously, um, but they were very proud to see that our, our community had stepped up in that way and acknowledged the importance of recovery. Next, we had an RCTV segment. Um, Sherry Vandenacker is RPS Today. Um, she hosted John Doherty, Julianne D'Angelis, and myself to talk a little bit about Recovery Month. And uh, with RCTV's help, we were able to reach more people. Then we hosted our first workplace event. We had a business breakfast at Fusion Restaurant with our Chamber of Commerce, where folks from around the community who are working in our local businesses um, learned a little bit more about substance use disorder and ways that they can help their employees. And then we worked with our churches to celebrate the idea of living in recovery and also to reduce stigma. So our churches got together with the help of Pete Jeffrey, who's our liaison to the Ready Clergy Council, to put up posters in all of the churches and to celebrate the idea of recovery by dedicating certain services and messages throughout the month. And then we also worked together on a project called Project Linus, where two of our churches, the Congregational Church um, and um, a few of the other folks, um, Thank you, Old South. Um, worked together to make handmade blankets. Um, and we also had some of our members of the board who got involved in that. And together they made 55 handmade blankets to go to children who may have been exposed to trauma in their home because of someone living with a substance use disorder. Then we had our regional forces for recovery right here at the high school. We hosted seven communities from around the region to celebrate folks living in recovery. We had a number of speakers, we had tables, information, and it really was truly a celebration for those who are living in recovery and also to remember those that we've lost through a candlelight vigil. And one of the things that was really exciting is Tom Zaya figured out that we could ring the bell for recovery, so we got to ring the bell, which was very exciting. Um, and for folks who were there in recovery, that meant a lot to them to see like that very public display about this issue. Um, and it was also really, I think, sentimental for those folks who've lost young people who've gone through the high school to have it here on the grounds of the high school. 
Then we had our annual coalition meeting, can't believe it's been a year, um, where we had Dr. Ruth Pody um, and Mary and Ryan speak. And I can't tell you how many folks throughout the year have come up to me and remembered specific quotes from Dr. Pody's presentation. Uh, RCTV really helped us spread her message by replaying it over and over again, and lots of folks saw the replay. So thank you to RCTV for continuing to share her message. Um, you know, she's a nationally known speaker, and we were very lucky to get her last year. Now it's pretty hard to get her <laughs> to, to come up to some all our communities, so we're very happy that we're able to have her. And so this is Sherry accepting the award at the, at the National Luncheon. And it's our beautiful award. And I just wanted to share a little bit about what Sherry shared, that she was honored to represent our CASA, and also wanted to congratulate Julianne for her work. Um, this really was Julianne's brainchild. She came to me with this idea, maybe in May or June of last year, and said, I think we should try to like put together this whole thing and really celebrate recovery in a big way, and we're gonna apply for this award. And I said, it's a national award, we're just a little town, I don't know how much that's gonna work. But she really was, you know, let's try it. And it was her faith that, you know, had us go through the application process. And so I was pleased as punch to see that we, that we won. And very proud of Julie for having the idea and really challenging us and pushing us because it did force us to get creative. And the other thing about this event is all in all, the event cost us, I think, for the entire month, under $200. So we use our resources pretty well. <laughs> But the reason there wasn't a lot of outlay of money is the amount of support we received from folks who are in this room, from volunteers, from, from folks who let us borrow things, um, or folks who paid to come to the breakfast, whatever it might be, that sharing of resources um, really created a true celebration of recovery in our community. So thank you to everyone. Thank you to Sherry for traveling to DC on our behalf. And very excited and very proud. So let's give ourselves a round of applause. So next I'm just going to give a few highlights from our last year. We had a lot of things going on in addition to Recovery Month. Our, our major goal is just to reorient everyone is to build community collaboration and to reduce substance misuse. We uh, take a drug free communities approach which is really focusing on the work of collaboration. We can't do this kind of work in a silo, it has to be done across sectors with, with other folks. Our three key partners, as Pat mentioned at the beginning, is the town, the police, the schools, and then in addition to that, we have all these amazing folks who are part of our board of directors. And really, the work can't get done without the collaboration. It is the heart of a coalition is collaboration. So together, we look at looking at a strategic prevention framework because this is a complex problem that requires complex response. There isn't any easy answers. If there were easy answers, we wouldn't be here. So thank you for everyone who has helped us grapple with this over the years and be creative and keep up the spirit when there's days when Julianne and I get a little like, this is hard. <laughs> thank you for all of that. So some of the main activities that we worked on this year, we had a lot of community education on vaping prevention, underage drinking, marijuana, and opioids. We had a, a lot of school projects, our community health, I'm sorry, our chemical health education program. ESPERT, which is Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment, which is a program that happens here at the high school. Um, our Red and Care Leaders um, Association, which is a group of young people that worked on dating violence and substance abuse prevention. And then Operation Prevention, which was a project funded by the Rotary Club to bring together resources from the Discovery Channel and the DEA into our classrooms to focus on opioid prevention. We also had a number of police in town projects, our RX Roundup, which is our medication collection program, which was founded in 2009. Our Interface Referral Service, which matches families with mental health service providers. And then our regional work with the Mystic Valley Public Health Coalition and work with Middlesex DA's Eastern Opioid Middlesex Task Force. The regional work is really important because there's lots of lessons learned and shared, and it helps us from reinventing the wheel, and we exchange and share so many resources that if you were to put a dollar value on what we get from that regional collaboration, I, I couldn't put a dollar value on it. It's, it's invaluable to us in our work, and it also is very helpful to have a group of colleagues that are in the same boat, so to speak. So some of the largest audiences we reached last year with some of our big events. Um, we sponsored an event here in this auditorium last October. Lynn Lyons came to speak about anxiety, and that was the largest audience we drew all year. There was over 400 families who came out, uh, folks who had children as young as kindergarten all the way up through high school and college 
And so that was a really well um, attended talk and we got a lot of feedback on how positive it was to bring them here. And I also heard that folks bought books and also followed up with her and so there was a lot of good work that happened after. Then we sponsored in the spring the Alex's story on opioid abuse for grades um, 11 and 12 here in the auditorium. Um, the story is a, basically a one-man show, so to speak, about someone's experience of living with opioid abuse. One of the things that was really compelling about the talk this year was it focused on the early use of marijuana and alcohol and how that really led to the priming of the brain to end up with an opioid use disorder. Our most requested topic hands down this year was vaping. You know, you saw it everywhere in the news and we were dealing with it all year long. Um, lots of lots of questions about what it was, how it works, why kids are using it, what can we do, and I was really encouraged by all the folks that came out to presentations throughout the year. We did have more students referred for, for chemical health violations for vaping than any other substance, and this was the first year that we saw an increase in nicotine violation substances, and that really coincided with the, the social awareness of vaping and the marketing of vaping to kids. Our interface referral service was our most popular service. Uh, we had 130 families get connected to mental health service providers. Our top three users of the service were our parents at the high school level, the elementary level, and the middle school level. Our RX Roundup was um, one of the projects along with our partnership with police that was also recognized at the national level um, by our national evaluation team. We were chosen as a evidence-based practice site for the work that we do with our, our local police. Um, one of the things that the feedback we got from the national evaluation team is they've never seen police mentioned so many times in a 160-page report because of the amount of day-to-day -day work that we do together. And they said that's one of the hardest things for coalitions to do is build that police relationship. So we now are educating other coalitions around the country on how to build that relationship and build that trust. So we're really proud to be our day-to-day -day partners with, with our law enforcement. And together we process more than 40,000 prescription drug bottles through RX Roundup, which is very impressive. So there's a lot of stuff happening, but what does it all mean at the end of the day? Are less kids using substances? Because that's what we all want. <laughs> and they are. When it comes to alcohol, we have more young people who are alcohol-free than when we started this project. In 2007, 52% of our students were alcohol-free. Now 64% are reporting being alcohol-free. Uh, we have more young people who perceive that their parents would disapprove if they were to engage in underage drinking, which is an important marker to help them consider refusing. More young people who perceive their peers might disapprove, which is another important factor. And then the perception of risk has stayed about the same. So that's an area that we're, we're looking at and working on. So as Pat mentioned, our website has so many resources and we always want to encourage people, if you missed a presentation or you want to learn more about a particular issue, there's lots on the website. And you can always email me or Julianne to get more information or invite us to come out to a place. I pretty much come to speak to anybody. And Julianne is great at gathering materials if, if you want to read something or have something hard copy. Um, we have all, that, all of those materials. So with that, I'm going to close my presentation and invite up our town manager, Bob Overshirt. Thanks, Eric. For those that know me, know me. It's very rare that I ask to speak, and it's almost never going to happen that you're going to see written remarks. What I have to say is important. Uh, recently, I celebrated my 13th anniversary of becoming a public sector employee. At first, I thought such employees were crazy. The dangers they faced, the scrutiny and criticism they endured, the long hours when they worked, and yet the smiles they always wore. I didn't understand why I was becoming one of them or how long it would last somehow I knew it was the right thing. As the years have gone by, I've recognized they aren't crazy. We just see things differently than most people. In fact, virtually every public sector job consists of people running towards the danger and the world when everyone else is running away. It's a concept that's difficult to understand or explain with words to others because it's really a language spoken deep inside a person. And those of us that work at Reading understand what a special place it is. To the extent that public service is difficult to explain, being a Reading employee is at times impossible to explain. 
We sometimes wonder why others can't seem to see that when it's so obvious to us. We're now pausing the annual meeting to honor and thank Eric McNamara, who has charged ahead into every challenge here for a decade. She has had episodes of heartbreak and also shed tears of joy. As a colleague, she has helped Reading be that very special place for which at times there were no words. And when Eric was, was presented with a once in a lifetime opportunity at UMass Lowell, all of us understood and wished her nothing but the best. Shortly, I'll step aside so that others may present to Eric the gifts, remembrances, and kind words. They're certainly well deserved. The gifts will adorn, adorn her office walls, and the words will remain with her always. In speaking to Erica about her replacement, I learned that her new opportunity indeed was terrific. And as we spoke, however, we saw a problem that we hadn't anticipated. Once we stopped relying on words, we saw the right thing, the only real solution. And next Monday, Erica, Erica will come to work at the police station, and she will charge ahead to meet new and exciting challenges, simply because that's what Reading employees do. So we interrupt this goodbye ceremony. Please join me in welcoming Erica back as our CASA director. singer of this giant band of rock stars and um, every call they ever made to Erica, hey have you heard of this? She would the, she'd answer the phone and say have I heard of it? Yeah we did that six months ago in Reading and do you want a PowerPoint on it? Do you want me to show you how to do it? So we're going to get up here and talk about I don't know what we're going to do without her so it's good to know we don't have to answer that question. Um, but we would like to present you with little plaque if you want to come up. We're going to have to send it back for uh, a word to be added. It's in appreciation of your continued dedication <laughs> to the people in town of Reading. like to introduce Sherry Vandenacker, who's our keynote speaker. She's going to speak on the issue of dealing with substance use disorder when you are the family member who loves someone who's suffering. This is a very important topic. I can't tell you how many times we meet people throughout the year as our CASA folks who um, are, encounter people who are struggling in their own families. And there's no easy answers, but I think Sherry has been able to put together a few things that I think are really important for us to hear and maybe come in handy when you are trying to support someone who's going through the same thing. So, let's welcome Sherry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, am ecstatic by the news we just got, Erica. Thank you for staying. <laughs> it's wonderful. Uh, I'm really honored to be here tonight, and thanks to all of you who came out. And I need to put on my 
Following my mother's death from alcoholism, I made a documentary film titled My Name Was Betty, The Life and Death of an Alcoholic, that uses her story to examine women's risk factors for developing a, the disease, for delaying treatment, and for relapsing from sobriety. I made this film with my sister's help and support, and My Name Was Betty is now used in treatment centers across the nation, and it's been viewed by more people than uh, my sister and I had ever imagined. Tens of thousands, we think, at this point, perhaps hundreds. We're truly honored that Betty's story has been instrumental to so many people in their recovery and healing. And I'm just going to pause for a moment to say that I'm particularly honored to be here tonight because those of you who know my story know that my mother's body was found um, sometime after she died. And today is the 11th anniversary of the discovery of her body. And so it's an incredibly powerful and moving day to be here talking. My sister and I are also honored that hundreds of people who love someone with a substance use disorder have reached out to us to share their own stories. Substance abuse disorder is deeply isolating due to the pathology of the disease and the stigma that still surrounds it. My sister and I understand that being in communication with so many people who love someone with this disorder is a rare privilege and a precious and powerful gift. And that's why I bring up the numbers of people who have viewed the film. Although each story is unique, many have similarities. We've learned and grown from our own experiences and from those that have been shared with us. And tonight, I wish to share some of the things that we've learned on our journey. I ask you to take anything that's useful for this talk and to reject anything that isn't because every situation is unique and you should trust your own truths and your own journey, just as I'm trusting mine. So the first discovery I'd like to share with you is that you're not alone. We know the statistics. We know that more than 20 million people in this country alone have substance abuse disorder at any given time. Virtually everyone we meet loves or at least know someone with a substance abuse disorder. Yet, as I noted, given the pathology of the disease and the stigma that still surrounds it, so many of us feel alone in our journey, but we're not. Please break out of your isolation. Reach out to the coalition, Erica and Julianne. <laughs> Attend an Al-Anon meeting. Seek guidance from a social worker or a therapist or just ask your close friends if you can talk with them. Chances are some of them have walked the journey that you're walking. The second discovery is that it's not your fault. It's not your fault your loved one has a substance abuse disorder. It's not your fault your loved one isn't getting treatment. It's not your fault that your loved one's relapsed. You know it's not your fault. You know in your head that if somebody came up to you suffering this experience, you would say to them, it's not your fault. Yet, those of us who love someone with this disorder are so quick to wonder in our heads, if only I had known this sooner, if only I had intervened differently, if only I had done this or hadn't done that, maybe things would be different. Please lay down that burden. I ask you to extend to yourself at least the same level of acceptance and compassion and gentleness that you would extend to a friend or a neighbor or a client or even a stranger who's going through this experience. As you navigate the complexities of your relationship with your loved one, be at least as generous of spirit with yourself as you are with other people. This is especially important because somewhere along the way, you or someone else involved in your situation is going to misstep. Are you going to make a decision based on incomplete information? Or are you going to have to choose the least worst of bad options? Allow yourself the grace to do the very best you can 
in demanding and continually shifting circumstances where there's often no clear or right answer. Discovery three, be angry at the disorder, not at the person who has it. It's not your fault that your loved one has a substance use disorder, but it isn't your loved one's fault either. Virtually no one chooses to develop a substance use disorder. Although there might be some family indicators or other signs that someone might be susceptible, there's no way to know who will or won't dis develop a disorder. One person can drink or use and not become addicted, and another won't. A therapist colleague of mine gives substance use disorder the name of SLICK. I found this way of envisioning substance use incredibly helpful. It helped me distinguish between times I was interacting with my mother, Betty, and times I was interacting with slip or disorder. I quickly came to realize that my mother was in a classic abusive relationship with slip. Early on, slip had promised her the world and it showed her a great time. But as her relationship with slip developed and solidified, slip isolated her from her family and friends as she tried to hide her drinking. Slick controlled her schedule as she became increasingly dependent on alcohol and needed to plan her schedule around her drinking. Slick controlled her money as she needed to purchase ever greater quantities of alcohol and to pay for medications and medical treatments related to her disorder and even to pay hefty legal fees and fines and penalties related to the legal troubles she got in. Eventually, my mother's relationship with Slick made it impossible for her to continue nursing, which is something she adored doing. And in the end, of course, Slick inflicted grave bodily harm on her, and in my view, it murdered her. I learned to redirect my anger away from my mother for taking up with Slick and towards Slick for abusing my mother. I did remain angry at my mother for never leaving Slick, but gaining clarity about what I was really angry at helped me navigate the complexities of loving her. Discovery four, you need support and you might need treatment yourself. Frankly, this discovery pained me and it infuriated. I found it incredibly difficult to accept that substance use disorder is in fact a family disease and that the unhealthy dynamics that are inherent to the progression of the disease are, in a sense, contagious. I was born to parents with active substance use disorders and there's no way around saying this. They were abusive to themselves, to each other, and to us. Every single day, my sister and I were exposed to toxic dynamics, and it took a heavy toll on us. When it became evident that I badly needed therapy in my teens, and then in my 20s, and then in my 30s, and then in my 40s, <laughs> uh, I was furious. Uh, my parents' substance use disorder had already inflicted so much pain and so much loss. It seemed profoundly unfair that I needed to devote additional energy and time and money into therapy and treatment to work through that damage. And at times, I strenuously resisted doing so. However, I came to accept that I absolutely had to get help in order to develop truly healthy relationships with myself first and then with other people. I can tell you that therapy and other treatments didn't simply help me reclaim my life. Actually, they helped me build a new life filled with joy that I truly didn't even know was possible to experience. I came to understand and accept my need for therapy and treatment through the disease paradigm. And here's what I mean. My mother was an emergency room nurse. She, and thus we, were frequently exposed to contagious diseases and more than our fair share of head lice, I might add. <laughs> I had several Mantu skin tests to check for tuberculosis over the years. It was a much more prevalent disease when I was growing up than it is now. 
If one of those tests had been positive, I would have needed treatment for tuberculosis, period. I came to see my exposure to substance use disorder similarly. I had, in effect, contracted a variation of substance use disorder from my family, and I needed treatment for it, period. In other words, although I understood that my parents' substance use disorders were not my fault, or even really my responsibility, I did understand that attending to my own dysfunction was indeed my responsibility. Seeking treatment was the only way to prevent myself from growing increasingly ill and from passing on the effects that I had acquired to other people in my own life. Discovery five. It's okay to step away from those you love in order to heal yourself. Those of you who know my story know that my mother never achieved sobriety in her life. As I noticed earlier, the complex pathology of substance use disorder includes isolation. My mother isolated herself from everybody who loved her, including me. However, at times, I needed to isolate myself from let me return for a moment to the tuberculosis example. If my mother had contracted tuberculosis and refused treatment, she would have been contagious, and nobody would have blamed me for saying I couldn't visit her or take her into my home. Nobody. In fact, people might have felt it would have been irresponsible for me to do so, especially when I had young children. I see my family's substance use disorder as an analogous situation. When my mother's alcoholism was particularly active, or when my own defenses were under assault, in order to maintain my own treatment regimen and my very hard-earned gains in mental health, sometimes I needed to create distance. This is different distance than not enabling someone else. This was distance that I needed for me, to meet my own responsibilities to myself into my family. If you've seen my documentary, you know that my mother had profound needs as a result of her disorder, especially at the end of her life. You also know that I was able to assist her with some of those needs, but not with others. People who have viewed my story and have been on a similar journey of their own understand two things. One, you can't help somebody who refuses to be and two, you can't help people beyond your own capacity. You have to recognize and accept their limits and your own limits. Many people, most people I think, respect the decisions you make around setting boundaries and limits and understand that those decisions arise from need, not from hard-heartedness and not from malice. But not everyone. Unfortunately, some people absolutely judge you. When I find myself being judged, and when I'm pained by that, I remind myself of the tuberculosis example I just gave. And I also say to myself, and sometimes directly to the person who's judging me, you have not lived my experience. When I say that sentence, it helps me validate my own reality and also not judge them in return for theirs. Discovery six, the opposite. It's also okay to be close to someone you love. We who love people with substance use disorders are urged not to become enablers. And of course, this is excellent advice, <laughs> but it's actually not nearly as straightforward as it sounds. I just explained that there were times I needed to step away from my mother. However, there were also times that I needed to step close to her, and perhaps even enable her in some ways, in some people's eyes. After several years of near total estrangement from everyone, mom reached out to me in the last months of her life to help her navigate the court system following her second arrest for DUI. My mother was not in treatment at that time, and she did not intend to seek treatment. I had some really difficult decisions to make. Here are two of them. One, 
I decided to take my mother to court, at least for her initial appearance. When I picked her up, it was extremely evident that she was an end stage of the disease. And she did in fact die just a few months later. I decided that I would be by her side as she faced these legal consequences of her alcoholism. Was I enabling her when I did that? Maybe. But would I do it again? Yes. On the way home from court, she asked me to stop at the liquor store to buy alcohol and cigarettes. Well, you can imagine how I felt. But when I looked at her, I could see she was pale and sweating profusely and trembling. She was having withdrawal symptoms, even in that short few hours without a drink. And I knew that if she didn't have one soon, those withdrawal symptoms would escalate quickly and dangerously. I also knew that if I took her straight home, the moment I left, she would have gotten into her car, her unregistered, uninsured car, and driven to the liquor store, putting herself and other people at even greater risk. So I did stop at the liquor store, and I cried in the car while she stumbled inside to buy herself some alcohol. Was I enabling her? Yes, I was. Would I do it again? I think so. Being present for my mother through this final crisis at the end of her life put immense strain on me and on my family. It might have made me an enabler at points, but it also allowed us to have conversations that gave us some closure and some peace. I'm grateful I had that opportunity because not everyone I'm grateful I allowed myself to step close to her at the end, even if my decisions might not have been perfect or right. Discovery seven, stay present in the moment. I found this one very difficult to do, <laughs> but to try, but I, but please try to resist the urge to rehash the past with your loved one or within yourself. If your loved one is still actively misusing substances, do your best not to live in fear about the future. If your loved one's in recovery, do your best not to live in fear that they'll relapse. And do your best not to imagine unrealistic, happily ever after scenarios. Whatever the situation you're in, do your best to remain present in it without abandoning realistic hope that things will get better. In those final weeks of my mother's life, I was present. I was present in rage. I was present in my anxiety, in my grief, and even in my gratitude that we did have time to make some amends. Frankly, they were extremely excruciating weeks, and I was kind of a mess. <laughs> but I subscribe to the words of the poet and philosopher Robert Frost. The only way out is being present in the moment allowed me to accept the help, support, and love that so many people offered to me as I walked that journey. I wasn't alone. Being present allowed me to connect to myself, to my mother, and to others. Being present allowed me to be honest and authentic, and I believe that that was tremendously helpful to heal. And that brings me to the final discovery I'll share tonight. Discovery eight. You can't heal. Healing, of course, is an arduous and thrilling and mysterious and ongoing and continually shifting process. My healing began when I confronted the reality of my parents' substance use disorders and their impact on me. With help, I've learned to mourn the loss of my relationship with my parents' true and best selves. With help, I've learned to accept my anger and to channel it. Not always productively, but at least not harmfully. With help, I've learned to recognize and feel grateful for the gifts that I receive from my parents, like my sense of humor, my passion for my career, my love of nature. I've also learned that for many of us, healing continues 
and possibly even accelerates after our loved one dies. We don't have to heal on the timeline. Healing happens as it will, when it will. Paradoxically, perhaps, loving someone with a substance use disorder has also taught me that a healthy and joyful life is built in the myriad small and seemingly insignificant decisions we make each and every day about how we treat ourselves and other people, about how we use our time, about where we put our focus and energy. So despite it all, I'm actually truly grateful to have loved people with substance use disorders. I've come to realize that although I fail at it to some degree each and every day, the love that I had with my parents and for my parents has taught me how to live and how to love. Thank you. being so brutally honest about how hard it is on the inside and how hard it is how hard it is when it's it's the person who you love the most right it's it's big stuff so thank you for that and I hope that each of you were able to take something uh, with you from Sherry's words um, I just want to say on a personal note, thank you to everyone who was so enormously supportive of me trying something new. Um, and I'll just say that um, for me, it was a fabulous opportunity, but my heart is here and we have a lot of work to do. A lot of work. <laughs> and so, thank you everybody. So with that, I'm going to close the meeting and invite our board up for their annual picture and short business meeting. And to all the folks who came out tonight, thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a great night.